we are going to talk about basic real estate concepts, okay? Basic. So now in these PowerPoints, let me get you so you understand them. In the upper right-hand corner of the PowerPoint slides, you are going to see a red star, a yellow star, or a green star, okay? If you don't see any stars, it's just additional information that we think you should know, okay? However, if you see a red star, this is a critically important item. This means that you should be able to put this in some sort of direct scenario as to, hey, Jane was walking down the street and she saw a house, but it didn't. Ha it had a for sale sign on it, but it said um, <clears throat> short sale pending. What is Jane supposed to do? And in, in that scenario, you're gonna need to know what to do during a short sale, okay? Just to give you an example. Um, so if it is a red star, I promise you, you are going to see it again, okay? If it is a yellow star, you need to have a moderate knowledge of this item. You're probably gonna, it's gonna be important, but not to the level as uh, one of the red star items, okay? So again, a moderate level of knowledge to pass. You don't even know it any less, you just needed to, to know what it is, how it is, how it works, okay? And then a green star is understand what the concept is. If you can define it, that's what you need to do, okay? You can define it. So red star is super important, yellow star is important, green star is a, don't forget this, okay? So that's how those work. And they're all on that first slide. I gave you the slide, you can go back and see it. Now, also, as we go through these slides, you're going to see a PT in a red arrow. And that we got from the Real Estate Commission, that means it is a problem topic, a problem topic on the licensing exam. So if the Real Estate Commission says that we have a problem topic on a licensing exam, I'm throwing this out there as my guess is that it shows up on the licensing exam, no? Probably yes, okay? So in that particular case, if you see that red arrow, then let's spend some time on it, let's understand it, okay? Now, if any of these things happen, a red star item, a PT item with a star, whatever, make sure that everybody understands. Do not be afraid to let me know you don't understand it. It's really important, okay? It's really important, okay? Now, anything that has a North Carolina star on it, right, the flag, that is North Carolina state specific examination stuff. Not everything here is, um, is, uh, is state specific, but if something doesn't have it, I'll tell you that it, it, you know, if it's North Carolina state specific or not, okay? All right, so that's the keys. Now, here's another secret. One more secret that we don't publicize. Take this from me. Now, don't be telling anybody. This is our secret. If you see something in red in the words, in these PowerPoints, a real good chance you're going to see them again. If you see something in blue on these PowerPoints, again, there's a real good chance you're going to see them again. Just put that under your hat. Don't tell anybody, all right? Don't share it with nobody. But if it's in red on these slides, you'll probably see it again. And if it's in blue, point of emphasis, you probably see it again. All right? All right. Don't tell nobody. Keep it for yourselves. All right. So let's talk about this. Ready to go? Here we are. So when we purchase land, we purchase land. I'm not talking about houses yet. I'm talking about land. We own to the center of the earth. We own the surface of the land and we own to infinity in the sky above. Okay. So earth's surface, right, to the center of the earth and to the airspace above it, and include anything as trees and water and surface that occurs naturally. So that is what's considered land, okay? That's what's considered land in this particular case. Now, we put a house on it. When we put a house on this land, now it's called real estate. We put up a fence, we put a house on it, we built a shed, swing sets, things of that nature, right? 
put a deck on by the pool, all of those things, right? Put a built-in pool in there. Those are physical improvements. Now you have created real estate, okay? Now you've created real estate. But there's something else though, isn't there? I bought a piece of property and I have a house on it. It's got a fence on it and everything else. Okay. Is that really the reason you bought that property? We can live in refrigerator boxes and survive very well. You just need a refrigerator. But that's not the reason we buy houses, is it? There's something else. All right. So both these land and real estate are material. We can feel them, see them, touch them. Okay. But what makes us purchase it? What's the why? What's, what's the American dream? What's the American dream? Anybody have an idea? Why? What's your why? Okay, value. Value is pretty intrinsic. Ownership. Isn't there a, a benefits, right? Yeah, all of those things. Um, isn't there a certain feeling about ownership, right? There's a certain goodwill about it. There's something there that says, yes, this feels pretty darn good. I can, I have possession. I can enjoy this. I can exclude this. I can exclude you off my property. Yeah, a place to call home, right? A place to call home has no physical value, but man, is it worth a lot to you, right? I get a house, I can dispose of it. It's a financial asset. 10 years down the road, I'm gonna make some money on it. Again, those are good reasons, all of them, right? I have rights. So I can dispose of this, I can enjoy it, I can exclude it, right? I can control it, I can do whatever I want with it as long as it's in the bounds of the law, and I can possess it, I can live in it. Those are called our bundle of legal rights, and we'll talk about those right at the beginning of chapter two. But we have what's called a bundle of legal rights. And you might, we'll see the acronym DEEP C, D E E P C. Um, well, you're going to have mineral rights. Absolutely. Hang in there 30 seconds and I will give it to you. I'll tell you what it's all about. All right. Um, so we're, we own the mineral rights underneath our land. Right? We own it. Um, so we have this real property, this feeling, these, this deep sea, disposition, enjoyment, exclusion, um, possession, control, right? D-E-E-P-C, okay? We have that. Those, none of those are tangible, are they? It's just that, that control, that feel. So that's our bundle of legal rights. That's what makes us want to purchase. It's mine, right? It's ownership in a in one way, right? It's ownership. This is mine. So this is what's called the bundle of legal rights, okay? Bundle of legal rights. And that is the center of the earth to the surface of the earth, the surface of the, surface of the earth and anything put on it, and to the sky above, okay? To the infinity, as long as it's not within the uh, restrictions of the law above you. Like we can't fly planes over the White House, right? We're not allowed to do that. P is for possession. P is for possession. Okay, we'll see that in a minute um, when we get into the beginning of chapter two. We don't really talk about the bundle of legal rights until the start of chapter two, right at the end. So then it's a short chapter. So the next thing we're going to talk about is this property, right? This real property. Any interests, any benefits, any rights automatically included. This makes it real property. So the land, we put a house on it with physical improvements. That makes real estate. We add the bundle of legal rights when we purchase it. That makes it real property. That makes it real property, and that's ours. That's what we love. Okay. So, all right, those three. Now, we'll get in the beginning. Like I said, we'll talk about real property as we go in chapter two. We start off in it. So, now, there are some physical characteristics of property. Physical. And the reason we need to know this more than even the economic is for one thing, and I'll, we'll get to it. All right, so immobility. This is a physical characteristic. 
Can you move the land your house is on? No, it's there. It's not moving. All right. Now, if you have personal property, we're going to call it chattel from now on. Chattel. We'll call it chattel here, and then we use personal property here. Chattel is any kind of removable or movable personal property. Okay. So, what is that? How do we define that? Well, I have a wife who works in the insurance business. And I asked her how they define personal property versus, um, versus real property. And their definition, and you probably heard this definition before, is that if you took that house and you turned it upside down, and anything that falls out or hangs from an electrical cord as you turn that house upside down, that's personal property, that's chattel, okay? Probably the best way to define it, right? That is personal property. If we flip that house upside down, anything that falls out or that's hanging from an electrical cord is personal property or chattel. And chattel refers to the movable personal property, furniture, clothing, toaster ovens that you have on the counter, um, microwaves that aren't built into the ceiling, but built on, plugged in on the wall, right? Anything you have there, okay? That is personal. So immobile, that land doesn't move. Indestructible, second one, indestructible. Can you destroy your land? Yeah, I know, you're all saying, I can dig a big hole and make, I can move it, do whatever. The latitude and longitude for that property is still right there. It may be at a different, they may have different topography. It may be different like in depth, but that latitude and longitude, that address is right there, same spot. So you can't destroy land. Now, for those of you who are out buying insurance, and now this is not an insurance class by any means, trust me, I do not like insurance. So I know I mentioned it twice already. All right, I'm not an insurance fan. My wife's been in it for 30 years. I defer everything to her. However, when you go to insure your house, they're not going to insure the land. Your dirt's always going to be your dirt. It's always going to be there. You can't burn it. You can't do anything to it. Right? You can't do anything to it. It'll always be there. Now, you can change. If you live on the beachfront, you can get catastrophic, you know, hurricane insurance, things like that. But go ahead and try to buy sinkhole insurance. I doubt you can get it without spending a billion dollars and going to Lloyd's, Lloyd's of London to do it. Land is indestructible, all right? Land is immobile. So indestructible, immobile. The third one in these physical characteristics is called uniqueness. Every different property, every piece of property is different from the other. Even if it is only the view out the front door, it is different, okay? So why do we need to know that? Well, because if you have a buyer and seller who agree to a contract, and all of a sudden, two weeks before the closing, the seller says, you know what? I'm not selling the house. I, I can't, I don't want to. Now's like a good time for me. I don't want to sell a house. I'm walking away from this contract. Now, the buyer can go to court. And the recourses are two. He can either get all of his money back plus any expenses he got to get that. But the buyer's not going to want that. The buyer is going to want that piece of property. And the seller is going to say, well, there's 10 houses in this community that are all for sale. They're all pretty much the same. Go buy another one. And the buyer is going to go to the judge and the buyer is going to say, but the look out the back door is, is different. This topography is different. This is flat. Those others aren't. They all see different things. I want to be able to look across the street at the ocean. And the judge is going to make that seller sell because of what's called specific performance. And specific performance is, Mr. Seller, you committed, and because your property is unique, the buyer is entitled to buy that property. So pack your stuff and the judge will make him sell it because of uniqueness in the physical characteristics. So that's one of the things that as we go down, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. We'll talk about specific performance and talk about 
um, defaults on contracts and things of that nature. But yeah, the court can force them to do it. Absolutely. Okay, specific performance. And that's why it comes down here. And we learn it on what? Night one. And then as we go, we'll talk about more of it because people will try to walk away. Sellers will try to walk away. Buyers are going to say, uh-uh, I want that because it's unique. Okay, because it's unique. It's different. And it could be exactly the same. Hey, you can drive by any kind of new build that you see. You don't have to go far to find new, new construction. It looks like they're building the exact same house. But yet, each one has a different view of the neighborhood. Each one may be, you know, maybe it's got different soil, different soils, anything like that. Everyone is different. Everyone is unique. Therefore, it's a physical characteristic. All right. Everybody good with that? Do we understand that? Even these three little things are very important as we go forward. This next slide is pretty important too, but I think a lot of these are um, more commonplace than what the physical characteristics are. So these are the economic characteristics. If I have one house and I have 10 people who want to buy it, what's gonna to happen to the price, the economics of that house? It's gonna go straight up, right, yeah, right? The price goes up. And that's really what we've been, up until, um, up until the last few months when interest rates started going up, housing has slowed down, but the prices haven't come down that much because there's still a lot of pent up demand. So it's kind of leveled off a little bit, still ain't going down yet, but because we have still have five people who want to buy one house. So scarcity, we don't have a lot. And it looks like they're building all over the place. And yet, not so much, right? So the first one is scarcity. That's the first economic characteristic, okay? We have a fixed supply. The second one is location, all right? and or our area preference in either case. Now, does location mean that it have to be, um, um, <clears throat> does it have to be a house on the beachfront? But sinus would be if I'm a doctor and I need to be at the hospital within 15 minutes, don't I wanna live near the hospital? If I'm an educator and I love to teach at the college, right? Um, Chapel Hill, if I'm teaching at Chapel Hill, I don't want to live in Wilmington and have to teach in Chapel Hill, right? So situs would be, I want to be close. So that is a economic factor for me, yes. The most important characteristic, where is it? Where do I want to be? Much like I said, um, Fayetteville, some of you folks are from that Fayetteville area. Can you um, <clears throat> tell me what happened when they said they were going to put that Amazon warehouse there? All of a sudden, everybody started to say, ooh, I'm like, I'm got, I work at Amazon. I'm going to work at Amazon. I'm going to move closer. With it, just by making the announcement, the price value went up. Price value went up. So again, location, area preferences, where we want to be, social factors. If I need to go home and live by my kids, my mother, my father, right? And there's no houses. There's only one house left and I need to be there. What's going to happen? I'm going to end up paying a little more, right? That's an economic factor. Again, social factors. Now, if I have a, the next one is improvements, right? Improvements. So um, if I have a uh, um, 1,100 square foot house, nice house, well done, good price point, right? Is that the same value as if I have a 4,000 square foot house with a built-in pool and uh, two acres of property and everything else, right? So it's different improvements. Yeah, sure, absolutely on the land. So depending on the size of the house, depending on what's in it, um, if we have regular general electric appliances or we have Wolf or um, Sub-Zero appliances, you know, what's in there? Um, you know, depending on the scale. Are we using, you know, uh, pure um, Italian tile or all of that other stuff, right? Do I'm not a crown molding fan, but you'd be surprised at the value people put on crown molding, right? Crown molding or non, okay? Puts a value on it, okay? That's, again, housing, infrastructure. Well, how's it built? Four bedrooms versus three small bedrooms, right? Again, pay more for it, okay? And the last one there under that economic is that over time, 
housing keeps up with inflation over time. Like anything else, you should never watch the stock market week to week, or you should never watch housing week to week. You got to look at it over a period of years. And ordinarily, it keeps up, plus it beats inflation, housing. As does the stock market, usually. And even though we go through a period of correction, same thing with housing, if you look at the period of the last 30 years, both have done rather well. Okay, so there is a permanence of investment there. It is a good investment. I think somebody said that earlier. I mean, if I'm going to invest in something that's relatively stable, housing's not too bad. Yes, it's overpriced right now, but maybe it isn't. Isn't the price only what people are willing to pay? That's the way I figure it, right? So, um, you know, in that particular case, we're going to, we don't know what the upside is. So we have good and bad, and it's going to go with the market. It's going to wave up and down, but constantly it's going to go up, right, over time. So scarcity, how much is it? Location, what, do we have, you know, work there? Do we have, uh, is that where I want to be? It's not all about the beachfront, right? Um, improvements, how big a house? What's it made of? How, what's the access to the local um, roads? Is it in the woods so much? A 5,000 square foot house in the middle of the woods where it takes me 40 minutes to get to the main road might not be as valuable as that 2,000 square foot house that's on the road, right? If I have to get somewhere in a, in a, in a hurry. Again, it's an individual decision. And then it's good overall long-term performance, all right? Good overall long-term um, investment. Problem number one. Problem number one. If you need money and you have a house, if you need money in um, two weeks, can you get it by selling your house? No, no, it's not liquid. You don't have it. It's going to take you a minimum of 45 days, right? A minimum. You might get lucky and sell it to a cash buyer in 30 days, but you still got to market it. You still got to do all that other stuff, right? So it's not liquid. It doesn't have liquidity, all right? So that is one of the disadvantages. It's not fast money. Okay, it's not fast money. And that is a disadvantage of real property. Okay, you can't just go out tomorrow and say, yeah. You, now you can get a line of credit, you can get a home equity line of credit, but that's still gotta get paid back. But if I have to sell this house because I need the money, it's gonna wait, right? It's not gonna happen tomorrow. Even just getting your mortgages or your second loans are gonna be take time. They're all gonna take time. Okay, so. Scarcity, location, improvements, permanence of investment. Two things that we need to be aware of. And again, remember I said the other day, reading is going to be important and every word is going to count here. Well, these two the improvements on the land and improvements to the land are two completely different things. All right. So improvements of a private nature. OK, if you build, build a house, if you put up fencing, if you put a pool in the yard, if you build a shed, those are improvements on the land, on the land. If you put in streetlights, sidewalks, driveways, anything that is public in nature, that is improvement sewer system. That is improvement to the land. OK. So if it's private in the nature, private in nature, belongs to you, you put it up there, that is improvements on the land. If it's public, that is improvements to the land. And by public so means that everybody's gonna have the ability to use these things, okay? So important distinction, two words change the entire meaning, okay? On the land is private, to the land is public. There's red and blue there on that chart. Use that for whatever you may. Let's talk about investment. And what is something called highest and best use? I have 50 acres of property. And I want to know what's the best use of this property? Well, a lot of it has to do with what's around you. If that 50 acres of property is right next to a new, um, 
a new development that just built 1,500 homes, do we need another 800 homes? Maybe we do, maybe we don't, maybe it's a parking lot. You're right, maybe it's a parking lot. Um, so those are things that maybe we can, you know, that maybe we see. How about maybe because we just put 1,500 homes in there, we need a school because they brought kids, right? So maybe that's the best use, highest and best use, right? Maybe we need more homes. I don't know, I doubt it, but those are things that come into you. What if um, I just built 15 more, 1,500 homes? Maybe I need another police station. How about a fire station that isn't 10 miles away? Right? I don't want these things burning down. Waiting. I don't want my house burning while I'm waiting for the fire truck, right? Too far away. Fire and rescue. Um, maybe just green space. Maybe we need a park. So all those things have to be weighed as to find the highest and best use, right? Now, in no way does that say most profitable. Now, building more condos and more houses would absolutely be probably the most, comp uh, most, um, most profitable. But is it the best use for the community? Talk to your community leaders. What do we need to do here? Maybe they'll buy it from you. Right? Maybe they'll lease it from you. Leases are good. You make some money on a lease. Right? We want to put a new hospital in. Can we lease that land from you? Sounds like I'm going to make some money on it. Right? And I'll still own the land. So highest and best use. All right. We have to figure out what, what we need that property for. Right? What's, what's the biggest need? Maybe it's a grocery store, right? Maybe it's a grocery store. Um, every domain is going to be a little different. It's going to be a little different because I don't want the government to take that 50 acres. That's my 50 acres. I'm going to make sure I use it um, the way I can make some money. I'll lease it first before I give it them in a domain. So, um, but very possibly that maybe we need bigger roads and they're going to take a piece of it through eminent domain. Right. So very possible. <clears throat> okay. Land use controls. <laughs> a nuclear plant. Okay. 50 acres. I don't know if that's enough, but. If I'm near the water, why not, right? A shopping center, maybe we need a grocery store. Yeah, not unusual. Um, and again, I'd be the leaser. I would be the, I would lease that land and I would just keep it and make some money off of it. Land use controls, right? We're gonna talk about that in chapter six. Public controls, which means zoning. What are we zoned for? Are we zoned for commercial, industrial, agricultural, residential. Okay, that's gonna be a public control. That's gonna be your local board, uh, your zoning boards that are gonna take care of that. And if, does anybody live in an in a, um, area that has a, an HOA, Homeowners Association or a POA? So anybody that does has what's called private restrictions. You signed your covenants and restrictions when you went in there, all right? Private controls. You can paint your, pro, you can, can't paint your doors. Maybe you can't put uh, commercial vehicles in your parking lot. Can't put your garbage cans out before five o'clock. Can't, uh, um, you know, all of those things. Can't keep horses on your property. Those are private for that community. So we'll talk about those in chapter six when we get there. Um, chat, uh, real estate is an investment. Again, we talked about it and you guys all know about it, right? Good long-term investment. Goes up with inflation, usually keeps up. There's a ton of tax advantages, right? Mortgages we can take off our taxes, uh, points we can take off our taxes, property taxes we can deduct off our taxes. When we sell it, we have capital gains exemptions if it's our primary home. So there are lots of advantages, right? The big disadvantage is that we can't turn it over quick. And that's really the key disadvantage there. The real estate market has been very good to us over time. So we don't have to wait too much. It's not impossible to lose money. You certainly could, depending on your timing. But the, most, the biggest disadvantage is it's not quick money. It takes time, okay? And we're always about supply and demand. If I have a million, if I have 500 houses and I only have 300 customers, what's going to happen to the price of my houses? It's going to come down. I want to get rid of them, right? It's costing me. Turn the other way around. I have 500 buyers and only 300 houses. What's going to happen to the price of the house? It's going to go up, right? That's supply and demand. It's that simple. It's that simple. You just need to know it. So all of these different specializations are inside real estate, right? Brokerage we just talked about. Now, you're going to need appraisers, right? They don't have real estate licenses. They have appraisal licenses. Appraisal license takes a lot more than what we do as a real estate. That's for sure. 
um, property managers. You're going to be. You're going to be. You can be a property manager with your um, with your license. Um, property management is hard. I'm the first guy to admit that. Property management is difficult because my office used to be when I had my office, we had a property management division, and I, I was not responsible for that. So, but I put my office upstairs because it was an office I could do business out of, and I would listen to where all these gals and they were all gals. Would they ran 800 properties? And I would listen to the phone calls that some of those gals took. And I am still waiting for the day that one of them gets a happy call. You either got an owner barking at you, you got your tenant barking at you. That is the way it is. Um, so you got to have pretty thick skin to be a property manager. My hat's off to them. So that's for sure, all of you who are doing those things. So um, yeah, definitely a hard job, hard job. But some folks are really good at it. So. So you can do that um, financing, get into the mortgage business, right? Some of you are mortgage brokers or have been. Um, I did that for about six months, um, learned as much as I possibly could, and then realized that not for me, not for me. I couldn't stand the uh, underwriting, um, all of that loan prevention that they go through instead of just writing the loan. They want to try to talk you out of getting the loan. So that's uh, the banks are working a little bit different. So financing is hard. Um, so that's that. You can do property development, right? Counseling. Um, you, we have real estate counselors. There is such a thing, right? Somebody to talk to. Um, we have tenant advocates, right? People who, uh, the tenants got to have somewhere to go. There are such things as tenant advocates. They use their counselors, all right? You can be dumb enough to get into education, which is what I did. Um, and then we have our professional organizations. Now, you hear agents or brokers being called Realtors. Realtor is the professional organization for brokers who choose to be held by a code of ethics. It is not everybody. It is not everybody. It is um, probably about 65 to 70% of all agents, brokers in the state of North Carolina. I know that last time I talked to um, somebody at the state association, it was that about 65 to 70%. If your broker is an, a realtor, he's probably going to ask you to join that board, or she's probably going to ask you to join that board. So, but not everybody is a realtor. Okay, so you can't classify everybody that. Now, realtors are a professional organization that give you extra education. They have it's like uh, a networking community, but they're held by a board, uh, they're held and bound by a code of ethics. And it makes it hard, it, it, it holds themselves to a higher standard, okay? And it's, um, there's, there's an entire, you got to go every three years, you got to go through training for ethics. You got to belong to the board. You, you know, you have to, uh, they're doing professional standards training, all kinds of stuff. And that's usually where they hear the grievances between agents and things of that nature. So the realtor board is not everybody and not everybody is a realtor. You have to join the organization. So that is a professional organization. So as I told you, your license is good for all five of these things, residential, commercial, industrial, agricultural. Special purpose would be churches, hospitals, um, post offices, police stations, you know, things that are community driven. Okay, they're not, they don't fall comfortably into any of these other four categories. All right, so that is uses of real estate also. Okay. Who needs a license? Well, if you remember LL Beans, if you list for somebody else, or if you do this for somebody else for compensation, now it does not necessarily have to be about money. All right, so let's get that clear. It doesn't have to be about money. It could be for vacation time. It could be for um, use of a condo over time. It could be for anything, Super Bowl tickets, you know, World Series tickets, whatever, all right? Any kind of gift that you, um, that you get, maybe it's lease a car for you. Okay, that's compensation. All right. So if you list, you lease, you buy, list it, lease it, buy it, exchange it, auction it, negotiate it, or sell it real property for others for compensation, you need a license. Now, that's a nice little acronym. And we're going to dive into this a lot more detail, but I need you to remember the funnel. See this funnel over here? This is really what it comes down to. If you are doing real property sales or um, any kind of negotiation for real property 
for others. For some type of compensation, you need a license. See what spits out at the bottom? Now you need to have all three of these. You need to have all three of these, okay? Other people can sell their houses for, for money and they don't need a license, right? For sale by owner, he wants to sell it, lease it, rent it, he doesn't need a license. If you are doing it for them and it's real property and you're doing it for some sort of remuneration, you are going to need a license to do it. Um, you can sell your own real property for money, it's okay. If you sell real property for others and don't accept any kind of money, you don't need a license. If all three of these things are together, you need a license, all right? Real property for others for consideration, all right? That means you need a license. All right, some key terms at the end of chapter one or unit one. <clears throat> we talked about chattel. Chattel is what? Personal property, right? Anything that's movable, anything that can come with you, anything that you can take out. Yeah, exactly right. Personal property. That's what that is. Land is to the center of the earth, the surface, and to the sky above. Okay. All of those. Land. Real estate is any man-made objects we've put on that land. Okay. House, fence, shed, pool, anything we've done. That is real estate. That turns it into real estate. And then we add the bundle of rights to all of those. And now we have real property. We're gonna talk about the bundle of rights in a minute, okay? That now we have real property, okay? Land starts, we put house on it, it's real estate. We get the bundle of legal rights and ownership, real property. All right, here's our LL Beans acronym. If you need any of these, right? List it, lease it, buy it, exchange it, auction it, negotiate it, sell it. You need a license. If you do it for somebody else, you need a license for compensation. All right. Wrong side of that. All right. True or false? Throw out a question for you. Bryce does not need a license to manage a triplex for his grandfather in exchange for free rent at one of the apartments in the triplex. True or false? Yeah, absolutely, right? We just talked about this. He's getting free rent is, is compensation. It's pretty good compensation, right? So Bryce would need a license. He's managing the property for someone in exchange for compensation, free rent. That's good compensation. That'll be fine. If you like this video, feel free to share it with a friend. For more real estate education content, please subscribe to the channel. From all of us at Seacoast Real Estate Academy, Thank you for watching.